No doubt, it was my passage from boyhood to manhood. I wouldn't trade a single moment of my 23 years in the, in the Marine Corps, good and bad, painful and not painful. I wouldn't trade a minute of it because it makes you who you are. Comedically, I say, join the Air Force. <laughs> if you want a good life, you want the air conditioning, I'm just teasing. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. Well, I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, but uh, I only spent about two years there, so I couldn't tell you much about it. Uh, and then my uh, dad got uh, transferred uh, by his company uh, to uh, back to Kansas City, which is where he wanted to go, because that's where he was originally from, so was my mom. So, uh, and that's where I was raised, in uh, Overland Park, Kansas. And for those who have watched you on the NFL pregame, that's why you're a Chiefs fan. Why well, I'm a huge Chiefs fan, Royals fan, and I went to the University of Kansas, so a Jayhawk fan. Jayhawk fan. Yeah. So basketball season's usually a little more exciting for you. But, usually, but this but year, this year we're, we're having good. a great year. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, we're winning across the board here. It's fantastic. <laughs> so you grew up with a number of different interests, one of which was flying. So how did that start, and how did that lead to an interest in the military? You know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, flying was not really on my radar, no, no pun intended, um, until I started to look into the Marine Corps. And the Marine Corps uh, officer, selection officer, was like, well, listen, you know, there's a lot of ways to, to try to get it, try to get you in uh, to this, because uh, it was a very competitive program to try to even get into. Um, and so I, uh, uh, he said, there's a, we have aviation contracts, we have ground contracts, you could try to do this, you could try to do that, lawyer, all these things. Well, I wasn't smart enough to be a lawyer. So I, um, uh, I said, well, and I think the ground contracts were full. So he's like, how about aviation? <laughs> so I was like, yeah, absolutely. And my grandfather was in the Army Air Corps back in World War II, and he always wanted to be a pilot. He ended up being an intel, and I think he, you know, he always wanted that pilot thing. So I think uh, he wanted to live vicariously through me. So he said he would pay for my pilot's license. And to a 19, 20 year old kid, I was like, that sounds amazing. So I was in Lawrence, Kansas at KU, and uh, they had a little airport out there with a little Cessna 152. And I went out and started taking lessons and got my pilot's license, I think, when I was 20 or 21. I think I had just turned 21. So that's when I got my pilot's license and started flying and, and absolutely loved it. Uh, you know, I took that, that test, that a, uh, AQTFAR aptitude, aviation aptitude test. And I did well enough to get a aviation contract, so. Now, you had twin goals though. You wanted to be a Marine and you wanted to be a comedian. So how did you make both of those work in those early years? Well, you know, the truth is I was a theater and film major at KU and I always wanted to be an actor and a comedian. I just didn't think it was possible. I thought it was too far-fetched. It's just not in the realm of reasonable, and it's not. <laughs> I wasn't wrong in my estimation. It's not reasonable. It's, it's, it's a pipe dream. It's, it's, it's so far flung. And from, you know, a kid from Kansas, and this was in the you know, late 80s, early 90s, I just didn't think that was something that was attainable. So, um, uh, and I had more than one dream. It wasn't just that, you know, that was definitely a dream. Uh, but I also wanted to serve my country. And so, you know, I thought this was more uh, something I could do. It was tangible. It was real. But the, so I, I went into the Marines. Now, the Marines and, and, and a life in the arts, they really don't, you know, they don't cross paths very often unless it's in an intangible way. So the intangibles. Uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, you have to have a thick skin. You have to have a never say die, uh, never quit mentality. Uh, a can-do mentality. Um, and the life, if you choose a life in the arts, you have to have a thick skin and a never-say-die, can-do attitude, okay? Those are the only things that parallel each other. Uh, those are the only things that are similar about the two. Other than that, they're not. Um, so there was no crossover, because people are like, how did one, how did you do one? You know, it's just, they're two different hats. I put on the Marine hat, and I'm a Marine, and I put on, now the, the intangibles were similar. Um, but yeah, you know, I wouldn't have gone for it. I wouldn't have tried a life in the arts, a, a pursuing comedy acting, had I not been a Marine. Because when I went into the Marines, you know, I was a fairly confident young man. Obviously, I was confident enough to go in the Marines and give it a shot. I had my pilot's license. I graduated college. I could do things. I wasn't incapable of doing things, but I just didn't, I don't know, believe in myself enough. 
And when I got to the Marines and I went through officer candidate school and I went through the basic school and I went through all these things, uh, I realized I could do whatever I set my mind to. And whatever my perceived limits were, those weren't my limits. It's what I, you know, if I thought, oh God, the most I could run is, you know, 15 miles or 10 miles, that's not true. You just don't know until you have someone's pushed you. And so I always had these perceived limits and the Marine Corps blew the lid off those. You know, so whatever I thought I was capable of, I was capable of so much more. And when I realized that, I started to believe in myself and I started to bet on myself. And I started to say, you know what? If I can do that, I can do this. And if I can do this, I can definitely do that, right? So I, 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 I realized recently it was the Marine Corps that gave me the confidence to bet on myself. And that was what allowed me to go, I'm gonna try this life in the arts. I'm gonna try this thing that when I tell people, hey, I'm gonna go be an actor comedian and they all roll their eyes, okay, I don't need their approval. I don't need them to you know, like it or not like it. It's what I'm doing. And it was good, it was good to bet on yourself. It was good to believe in yourself. But that came from the confidence I gained in the Marine Corps. So I, I do credit uh, the Marines in an indirect way. Uh, for, for giving me the nudge to go for it, to chase that dream. My first deployment was actually Liberia. It was uh, in Africa in 96. And that was a you know, simple uh, special purpose MAGTAF, one ship deployment, USS Ponce de Leon. We went over and evacuated the embassy and, in, and then all of our third country uh, uh, allies, you know, people that didn't have a Marine Corps to come get them. Japan, Belgium, whoever else, we were, we were getting everybody out. And um, so that was an interesting deployment because I was actually in the embassy in Liberia, uh, summer of 96, very interesting time. What was going on in the country at that time? It was a civil war. It was a big civil war and it had spilled out of the countryside into Monrovia. And so the, the fighting had got, become very intense and became a very dangerous place. And so people were getting out. You're racing against the clock here. Yes, and, and there was a lot of, you know, Tensions are high, people are scared. You know, these things are, are, are um, fluid situations that have a lot of intensity, uh, and it doesn't take much to set off things that can go wrong. So everybody, it was a, it was a lot about communicating and being very clear uh, and, and moving swiftly and, and doing what we needed to do, protecting our embassy, making it real clear this was not to be approached, uh, and at the same time, being able to get out and get the people that we needed to get out out. Uh, so that was a, a really uh, interesting and, and fun mission. And it was, uh, you know, it was fun to sail across the Atlantic and then, you know, uh, get to do that deployment. Kosovo, uh, Kosovo actually came after um, Albania. So <clears throat> when this crisis broke out with the Serbians driving the ethnic Albanians out of Kosovo, it created a humanitarian crisis um, on the border of uh, Albania and, and Macedonia and all these countries that were neighboring Kosovo. So we had a humanitarian crisis. So the first mission was humanitarian. So the first part was Operation, uh, uh, joint, uh, joint Operation Shining Hope. Um, and so that, that was what I, uh, I took part in first. And then uh, we were doing a bombing campaign, uh, the United States along with NATO, to drive the Serbs out of Kosovo and stop their you know, drive uh, south. And that worked. And so when the peace broke out, so to speak, uh, we moved into Kosovo to secure the, the area. And there were different sectors. There was an American sector, British sector, French sector, and I even think a Russian sector. Um, uh, so we moved uh, the Marines from the 24th Mew, rolled up, came ashore in Greece, came up through Thessaloniki, up into Macedonia, and up into Kosovo to secure. And so I, I moved from uh, from. Uh, Albania, where we were working on refugee camps, and joined the MU and came ashore and then went up into Kosovo. And um, uh, that was a, a really fascinating time. There was a lot of uh, being with the MU. It was, it was interesting. Uh, we had a lot of uh, media on the battlefield, so to speak, uh, and, and we had to look out for them because they're not very careful and they can get themselves in a lot of trouble. Um, and we still had a lot of, we had a lot of scared uh, ethnic Albanians that had gone to the hills, the KLA, the Kosovo Liberation Army. Uh, we had a lot of Serb farmers. There were still people shooting at each other. I mean, it was a real Wild West feel out there. Even though the Serbs had left, uh, someone had to be in charge. You know, uh, power hates a vacuum, right? So someone had to be. So we were trying to get in there, but, uh, you know, 
he had a bunch of people shooting at each other. So every day your head was on a swivel. Um, but I learned and that was in all parts of the country. It was all parts of the country. Um, and, and, uh, uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot on that deployment. Um, and it was, uh, a, a really special time, I guess, cause you know, uh, I, I was a captain at the time and, and, uh, uh, I worked very well. I had a, a great group of Marines I was working with and, and uh, got to do some fascinating, fascinating things. Uh, and then after that, my, uh, my next overseas deployment was Afghanistan. Right. So When did you go there? And well, <clears throat> so I left active duty in 2000 uh, after eight years and immediately joined the reserve unit in Manhattan, New York, uh, MTU 17. And uh, so when 9-11 happened, uh, about less than a year after I left uh, active duty, um, uh, my unit was activated because we were the only unit in Manhattan, you know, Marine-wise. Uh, so when they closed the bridges and the tunnels, we were activated that night of September 11th, and we reported to Ground Zero and worked on the rubble piles and the bucket brigades, and I was part of that for, for, for uh, till September 30th. And, you know, I was moved, obviously, by that experience. That was... Um, something I'd never experienced, uh, no one had. It was, uh, uh, if, you, if you recall those, back to those days, you know, it felt like a, a gut punch. It was, uh, everybody was in shock, you know, and everybody wanted to do something. Well, I was a captain in the Marines and I could do something. I had a green badge with a skiff clearance and, you know, I was like, well, I know they're gonna need green badges. I know they're gonna need people. So, uh, after being down at ground zero for that time, I, I just, I told my commanding officer, I said, put me back, you know, put me back on active duty. I want to go back. And, uh, so he said, okay. So he, he submitted my name down to central command. And I think they saw that I had the badge and stuff. So they were like, we need them. Cause I knew they were going to need people. You know, I mean, we were gearing up for this global war on terrorism. It was just starting. And, um, sure enough, they picked me up on November 10th, the Marine Corps birthday. Uh, November 17th, I reported to Central Command. November 30th, I was on a plane to Afghanistan. So, I mean, it was bing, bang, boom. Um, you know, which is why you have reserves, right? Um, and so uh, I did a year tour at Central Command. Um, went to Afghanistan twice during that year tour. I worked out of the Joint Operations Center back at Central Command in, in Tampa. Um, and then I came back uh, after that and uh, about a year and a half after I got back from Afghanistan, I got on Saturday Night Live. So, and it wasn't just like it happened in a year, by the way, a year and a half. I had been grinding in New York for about seven years, you know, doing comedy and improv and sketch comedy and stuff. So it, it had been a long time coming. Uh, but it was about a year after I got back from Afghanistan that I got my first break in show business. Well, as another actor said, uh, success looks a lot like hard work. <laughs> you got that right. Yeah, yeah. I, I never want to discourage anybody from a life in the arts, but I want to manage their expectations. I want them to be realistic if they're going to approach it. And it's, it's about 10 years of grinding on average. It could be less. It could be more. But on average, you're about 10 years of, of, of really just grinding and learning your, your craft, getting in your 10,000 hours, doing all the things you need to do so that you can be ready when the opportunity comes. In addition to uh, the other things we've talked about, you spent time uh, with the USO, entertaining troops overseas. And since you've been in their shoes to some extent, you know better than most entertainers perhaps about what they're missing about not being home and, and what's going to really lift their spirits there. So what from your own experience did you kind of draw into those particular performances? I was always mad. I, I mean, I, I was always pissed that I never got a USO tour. With all my deployments, no one ever came over. I was like, this sucks. You know, all this deployment, no, not one, inter not one. So I always felt like I was gypped a little bit when I was deployed. And I remember saying to myself, because I, I was still, you know, I was always had a plan to pursue a life in comedy and acting. And I said, if I ever have any success at all, where anybody would want me to come back or, you know, I, it would be... I am going to come back. I am going to come back and entertain the troops somehow, some way, because I always felt gypped. So as soon as the opportunity presented itself, as soon as I got some traction in show business uh, and the USO thought it would be a good idea to send me, I went. And I, I think it was one of the best things I've ever done. And I've done it a couple times, you know, so it's, uh, you know, anytime I do it, it's, it's, 
really special. Um, I remember going to Iraq in, in, in the summer of 2007 when it was really the height of the violence. If you, you, know, if you look at a line graph, that was the absolute pinnacle of, of the, the violence in the war in Iraq. And, and I remember being over there, and, and I specifically wanted to go to forward operating bases, the guys who don't get shows, right? Because they have big shows back in Baghdad, or they have big shows in the green zones or whatever. But I wanted to go out to the forward operating bases uh, that, you know, small little groups, you know, that didn't, that weren't getting anything from home. And I, I brought a really great group of diehard comedians uh, that were very uh, entertaining, very patriotic, because they're putting it on the line a little bit. You know, we're out, going out to these four, I remember there was a basketball court at one of these fobs, and we were doing the show, and it was so hot because it was summer, right? So we, we would start the shows at sundown, because and then it would be 118 as opposed to the 135 or whatever it was during the day. So it was still crazy hot, but it was at nighttime. And we were behind these HESCO bunkers, right? You know, the, the man-made bunkers that they, you know, they fill with concrete or they fill with rocks and sand and dirt, and they stack them on top of one another to prevent any shrapnel or whatever. And... We're behind these Hesco bunkers, on, and we're on the basketball court, and we start the show, and all of a sudden, ta da 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 And I'm like, should we stop? Should we keep going? And everybody's sitting down on the basketball court, keep going, it's no big deal, just go. I was like, all right, here we go, you know, and the rest of the guys, you know, they're like, ha, 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 you know, and it was, but it was awesome. We had we put on a great show. Everybody had fun. I brought Horatio Sands from Saturday Night Live, uh, Paul Shear and Rob Hubel, uh, you know, just a great group of guys. And we put together a sketch show and a little bit of improv and a Q&A and a little bit of stand up. And we just tried to make a, a fun show for everybody. And I remember before I went, um, John Stewart uh, gave me some advice. You know, he said, hey, what are you planning on doing? I kind of told him that what we're thinking about doing for the show. And he's like, great, 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 great. He goes, if, if you're going to do any stand-up, just kind of remember who you're talking to. Remember your audience. I was like, yeah, I, I, yeah, I got it. And he goes, okay, you got it? I was like, yeah, I got it. Went over. And I remember that first night we did a show in Kuwait just because we got to Kuwait. We're like, hey, let's do something. you know. So we went and did something. And I remember I, I told a few jokes, but they were from, like, from the act, from the club act back in you know, the States. And I was like, oh, they don't care about luggage at an airport or whatever. They don't care about that. They want to hear about their world. And so it dawned on me that first night. I was like, oh, that's what John meant. So I went back and just pencil whipped out some, some jokes about their world. And I remember what it's like to be on that side. So I was like, mm, this is what I would want to hear. This is what I'd want to hear. So the next night we went out and we did a, a show at, I think it was Buka, Iraq, where they had the big prison. And... Uh, you know, we did some, I loved the sketches we did, a lot of fun, but on the stand-up portion of it, I made it about their world, and it changed the whole dynamic, and it was so much more entertaining, in my opinion. So it was great advice from Jon Stewart that, that helped on that, too. You can also bring your experience into the entertainment that you do, apart from the USO shows, and I'm thinking particularly 12 Strong, for example, and other things that you've done. How do you bring your personal experience into some of those roles, even if you haven't had the same experience as those characters? And perhaps how do you help the other actors who haven't been where you were to, to kind of get a better idea of what the, the story is all about? I think just talking it out, you know, talking it out. Thinking, what is thinking? Thinking is asking and answering questions. That's all thinking is. You know, so when someone says, think about it, say, okay, well, ask a question and then try to answer it. And that's, that's all it is. So, so, I, um, when I create a character or when I get a character on the page, I have to try to understand who is this guy, what's his world, how does he fit into the world, uh, what's his tone, what's his attitude, how does he view things, and then you start ask, asking and answering questions in that character's mindset. And once you can do that, uh, it was an old improvising uh, um, uh, training technique or uh, we, when we used to do improvised shows or whatever, if you had a character that you had created, you needed to be able to answer questions as that character without even thinking, you know? So if I was playing a redneck, you could ask me anything. I'd be like, yeah, I know exactly what I'd do then, son, you know, or whatever. And you think and act and react. And so um, I was lucky because I had a, 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 some experience in some of these, very personal experience like 12 Strong, where I ended up playing Lieutenant Colonel Max Bowers, who was my boss in Afghanistan. 
You know, the movie ends in 12 Strong, where the movie ends, it's when they take Masri Sharif. Well, about a week, two weeks, whatever it was after, after that, it was shortly after uh, the movie ended, that's when I joined their unit. <laughs> so I used to report to Colonel Bowers every morning and every night, and so I, I knew the man. And then when I got asked to play him in the movie, I was like, oh, this is great, I, you know, I actually know the guy. Um, uh, and then when I work with actors who have never had any military experience, I'm more than open to talking about, well, this is why they're saying this. And the, you know, if you give them some, some uh, um, context, it always helps. It always helps people go, oh, well, that makes sense. Well, that's why he would say that. Because sometimes they're saying things and they don't know, why would I say that? You know, and you say, well, because you're the boss or, you know, you have a boss or whatever it is. Um, that's why you would do it if you give context. So I'm, I'm always open to helping anybody who wants it. Also, I would never, if they don't want it, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to force it. But, uh, but uh, when it comes to me, I, I always like to try to ask and answer questions around my character and then just be as truthful as I can. That's all you can do. You can't go in there and do anything else. Uh, now, unless you're playing for laughs, you're doing a character, some weird thing where you got to, you know, uh, you're missing an eye, you got a patch on an eye, or you got to, you know, there's things you can do like that. But as far as uh, the rest of it, it's just trying to be truthful. If a young person came up to you, and maybe some do, and said, I'm thinking about joining the Marines or the military in general, should I? What do you tell them? Comedically, I say join the Air Force. <laughs> if you want a good life, if you want that air conditioning, I'm just teasing. Um, no, of course I encourage them. I, I think it was, it was a, no doubt, it was my passage from boyhood to manhood. Um, and it, it was really powerful uh, experience for me. I wouldn't trade a single moment of my 23 years in the, in the Marine Corps, good and bad. Painful and not painful. I wouldn't trade a minute of it because it makes you who you are. And, and so I would encourage them. I think serving your country is, is a wonderful thing. It's, a, it's something that is necessary. We need, we need Marines. We need soldiers, sailors, airmen, um, Coast Guardsmen. Uh, we, need, we need you. So I would encourage them to. Um, and and I, uh, I would make sure they, they want to do it.